For investors, by investors. You're listening to the only show on the planet for real real estate investors, wholesalers, rehabbers, landlords, private lenders, cash buyers, fix and flippers. This is Real Estatepreneurs. Hey guys, welcome back. You're listening to the second part of last week's episode. Let's jump back in. So what's working now? So it seems like you might have some insight because I know you have marketing teams, you have sales teams, and we talk about that a lot on here. And we were laughing a couple episodes back talking about direct mail and all that. So what do you see is working then? What are the things that that are making your people stand out in the marketplace? I'm going to give you an answer that's probably not going to thrill a whole lot of people. (laughs) It's about getting back to the basics right now where you used to be able to be loose operationally, meaning you could not be really efficient with your lead. You could just kind of scrape up top, just return calls to people that are leaving you quality voicemails telling you they want to sell or only spending time with people that you know are home run deals. It's not really possible anymore. You really have to nurture your leads. You really have to spend time qualifying your leads, building relationships on the front end and not just, I mean, I used to do the same thing try to get a couple hundred calls a week, just spend time with the 10 to 15, 20 people out of those couple hundred calling in that I think not, and then everything else just went away. Now you need to have consistently thought that just needs to be a bigger and bigger pipeline that you're nurturing more and more throughout the year. So I just think operationally in every sense, you have to be really tight. You can't be lazy. You can't just send direct mail and answer a couple calls getting back to sellers quickly. You have to be able to make decisions really fast. You have to be able to to follow through. And daisy chain contracts don't work. You can't sell other people's properties. So you need to have quality buyers lined up that are going to close, that are qualified. And the only way to come back to the basics is to be able to have people that can execute on those things. So you're only going to be as big in any market right now in the country. You're only going to be as big as you're willing to invest in your team and the resources to be able to help you grow because it's about the small things. You've got to be able to communicate at local events and go to title company meetups and go to the, have a local presence. And, you know, people in the groups are going back to doing things like there's door knocking systems coming out no. and, and notepad things, right? Because, It's so hard. If you just cold call a market in Dallas, Fort Worth right now, we have tons of clients right now. All of them are just calling every house in every zip code. Wow. You know, every single house, if they're within the affordability index, because those houses, if there's any margin, they trade instantly. And, and so the only way to compete with that is that to be able to leverage other people's time to do more. And I keep saying leverage other people's time. You have to have somebody, you can't be the one doing every single thing across the board and expect to ever have any real momentum. My opinion is the only way to to really be successful is to analyze your systems and processes, which is not a sexy thing, but really look at what everybody's doing every day. The, The one quick story. Do you have kids? Yes. Okay, how old are your kids? My son is five years old. Okay, so you ask your son at the end of the day, hey, what's your son's name? Hudson. Hudson. Hey, Hudson, how was your day today? What's he going to say? Good. Good, good. And then you follow up with, hey, what did you do today? What is Hudson's response? Usually it's good. Good? Right. <laughs> okay. It's like, good. And you're like, good. Well, so tell me about it. Like, what did, and there's all this prodding that has to go on, right? And then somebody else may be like, well, you color this one. Oh yeah, I color. And then he'll start telling you a specific story once you pry and they go in. Right. And it's funny because we've all had those experiences with kids and we all go through, how's your day? Good. Tell me about it. Stuff. Well, if you ask yourself or your team members or employees, if it's five o'clock and people are walking down the office or you constantly say, Hey, Dr. Duke, how's your day? You would tell me good. Good. Yes. Yeah, it's it really busy, but it was, it was good. I say, okay, what'd you do today? You go, what, I don't know. What do you mean? I did like tons <laughs> of stuff. And like, you know, I had this call with Rob. I did all these things. I like, I was super busy. But if I asked you what you actually did all day, it would take some poking and prodding for you to think at a step-by-step level what you actually did throughout the day and how you executed those tasks and how you actually got 
your stuff done. And when you log in to the MLS, type in your username and password, you don't even think about being on autopilot all day. You don't even realize that that's, you're just kind of doing your day because you know how to do your day. So if you want to compete in any market right now, you have to first slow down a little bit and think about what you're doing all day. If you don't have all your steps and processes, which are just systems, right? Things that can be done over and over again. If you don't have that really structured and written out, I think you should either do that or get some help. Because I was terrible with that. I was really good at just running through walls, but I was terrible at stopping to say, all right, maybe I should just like build a door and walk through it. Hmm. Which meant in, in a more tangible sense, like running comps, I would just like run comps one house at a time. Well, then when I hired somebody that was really smart and good at that, and another person from the Philippines, they just created spreadsheets and by neighborhoods and areas, we started creating averages. So when, and then when our marketing went out, we kind of knew what a house was worth based on as soon as they told us the neighborhood. So I wasn't starting from scratch every time. Comps weren't having to take near as much time. Someone else could just run the initial numbers and then I could be confident in, in re-screening those numbers. It was the only way for me to now look at 100 houses a week and make 100 offers on legitimate properties instead of the number of hours it took. So I know it's easy to talk about, hey, you need to hire people. But that's the only way to really get some leverage and really be able to make a whole bunch of offers and be confident in the numbers that you're running and, and be confident in the conversations that you're having with both the sellers and the buyer side because you've got accurate numbers and you've got some momentum. The only way to do that, in my opinion, is to have some help getting through the day to day. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Leverage. Uh, we in real estate, we're all about other people's money, like you said, but this is other people's time, like the other, the other one, right? We can leverage human capital. <laughs> yeah, once, once investors get to a certain point, meaning they have some consistency in their day, once they build a business big enough where they've got a few transactions and they're doing some pretty good business. If I surveyed our client partners that are at that point and I said, hey, if you could do the exact same number of transactions that you're doing right now, make the exact same number of the amount of money, but you could get some of your time back, would you be willing to make that investment? And a hundred percent of them would say yes. Easy close. All of us are willing, you have to have our time freedom. Get, I see that snowboard right there, hit the slopes, be able to do things that's actually meaningful. It looks like you have a kid's drawing behind you there. That is time, your time is what's really valuable to you. It's really meaningful. And so when you survey yourself at the end of the day and you say, what did I do today? What did I actually do? And you think about it. You think about actually line by line, all the time that you spent throughout the day, was that really worth your time? If you look at your five-year-old and the, how valuable he is to you and the time that he spends to you, and then you look at the majority of your day when you're at work, are you really doing what's right by your family, by how you're spending your time in the day? Because like running comps and answering the phone and doing admin work and doing the basic things it takes to run a real estate business, in my opinion, is not the highest best use time of any operator's business. No way. Low value activities right there. Right. Low value activities. So I saw something interesting on your site and I'm curious about it because I happen to have, uh, well, me and Cupcake, my wife, we have rentals. And we don't have a big portfolio, but we do manage quite a few. And you say that you guys can do property management. I don't understand how you can do that if you're not on the ground. Okay, well, if a light bulb goes out, what happens? Here? Yeah, what happens? If it ha they call us and we say, change your own light bulb for Pete's sake. So whether it's a maintenance request, whether it's general service line, whether it's tenant application and screening and processing, when you're listing, you lease a property and you've got applications and you have showings, most of that is done on the phone or computer. The vast majority of property management is one of the easiest ways for us to come in and add massive value right away because so much of property management is just grind. It's unappreciated, important work that nobody wants to pay for. It's why property management is one of, it's a tough business. It really is. Um, every property manager, your mission is to provide for the owner, whether it's yourself or you're managing for other people. Like you guys sound like you're managing for yourself. Is that yeah, right? Yeah. Okay. So your moral obligation as the owner managing those properties is to maximize the cash flow like that as the owner, as the business, that's what you're trying to do is maximize your ROI on those assets because that's what they are as assets. 
but you also have humans in there that you have to provide a quality experience for. So how do you create a valuable asset that's going to produce a quality ROI, meaning a good performing asset, and provide a good quality experience for the tenant base as well so they stay forever and your tenant duration is really good, which is just going to further drive up the ROI in that asset. The only way to do that is for people to answer the phone and communicate and do all the things that are usually really expensive and time consuming to hire people to answer calls, CSA lines and do all the things. Because most of the time when tenants call, are you going to send somebody out there? Are you going to give them some instructions on how to do it themselves? Yeah, uh, it depends on uh, if it's a plumbing issue or electrical, we're sending people out there, but other stuff, not so much. Right. So that's just an escalation ladder. When the phone rings, our teams answer that. They go through the process of figuring out what the problems really are. If there's a leak or there's something going on that is going to be an important fix, oh yeah, that, that's an escalation. That'd be a level one service escalation that the system process worked through. You'd get a call right away. So, and then you would be all over that. But if the light bulb went out in the closet there would be a whole follow through just like when you call AT&T. They don't just send somebody out immediately because your cable goes down. They walk you through how to unplug. And the first thing they do is, what do they say? Did you unplug your box? For no, yes. Plug it back <laughs> you have to go through that process with them before they send out a dispatcher. It should be the exact same way in your property management business. Somebody should be answering the phone. Somebody should be talking to tenants because the tenants want to talk to somebody. Somebody needs to answer the phone, walk them through the process, and then either escalate it to where we, we have a true emergency. The house is on fire, we better be calling 911 right away. If, it's, if there's some kind of level one plumbing, electrical, the roof is leaking, I think is, would be the big three there. Yeah, the level one escalation goes right away. If it's one of the other things, we try to walk them through the process. Reconciliations at the end of the month, the accounting and bookkeeping piece and property management is where people fall down a whole lot. Yeah. So we're not CPAs, but we're able to keep people's books really clean in the day to day. So property management is one of the most tedious task oriented businesses there is. And each one of those tasks are important in the whole scheme of things to get done. But usually it's a grind in those, those individual tasks. And so anybody who's willing to spend a little bit of time with our development team to map out how they actually do stuff and just walk us through it, property management is one of those places where we can help people accomplish their mission pretty quickly. There seems to be several of those areas that you've put together. <laughs> I'm looking at your site like, yeah, that sounds good. Oh, that looks good. Is it now, is it just real estate professionals or do you have other verticals? We do everything. So business is business. And what we do, the first step is always a discovery phase. I have a real estate background. So when I first started a essentially the staffing company we have now, I was focused on real estate investors and operators and property managers because that's what we knew and that's what my core competency was. But at this point, we have a, you know, our support team, as our company support team is over 70 people. I think we're pushing 80 something people. So the team, become something truly special. It's far outpaced just my real estate knowledge. The business is now truly a, a BPO, a development business for our client partners. And the way we do that, whether you're big, small, it doesn't matter who you are, where you are, what you're trying to accomplish. The first step for us is for our development team to spend a little bit of time with you to really understand your business, who you are, what you're trying to accomplish, the way you both operate now and where you're trying to go. We work with you from that discovery phase to create the plan. And I like to think of it as like the, when you go bowling and you put the bumpers up in the lane, those bumpers, they're there for, to keep everything in the lane, right? They're the accountability piece. Most people don't have the bumpers built in their business and that's the systems and processes of the day to day. How do you log into the MLS? What's the website? What's your username? What's your password? All of those things, just to log into something's four steps. You know how to do it. Could you teach someone else how to do it without having to stop and think about it all the time? So we go from that discovery phase to the bumper phase, what we call a systems and process phase, where our teams create step-by-step -step the systems and process for every single vertical within your business, whether it's lead management or admin or accounting or dispositions or transaction coordination. We spend time to, to map out all of those individual verticals. Unless you just have it all done, which is great, 
then we would move to step three, which is where most people start. And we think that's the biggest problem is that most people just start by hiring the, someone that they're hoping is going to be the right fit. By starting in the discovery phase, working through systems and processes and getting really clear, that creates the job description. That job description is how we go match the right person to fill that role. Someone, a lead manager, very different than a bookkeeper and somebody that's going to help out. And we identify those roles in a couple ways. One is the traditional recruiting and training method that we all do, even here in the U.S., exactly the same. We screen over 4,000 resumes a month. We hire less than 2% of those people. And then they come into a six to eight week training platform that we have to familiarize themselves with what we're doing here before they get placed with our clients. But we also use personality profiling. We're, um, we use culture index because it's one of the few that is held up in court legally to be statistically relevant and therefore usable as a tool to hire. So we do that with all of our, our team members are, are going through the culture index process. So we're going from alignment and systems, which creates the job. Then we find the right person that, to go fill that. And then we send you three, four, five candidates that we think would be a perfect fit for that job description. You set up an interview on Zoom. My team facilitates exactly like this. And when you find the rock star candidate that you are just so excited about joining your team, our team then facilitates the onboarding and the handoff, and we stay with you for the life of the account. So this was born, what I'm describing this process, was born out of exactly what I wanted when I was a real estate operator. I wanted an easy done for you button. If I wanted a lead manager, I literally wanted to press a button and have somebody that could be competent on the phone. And I just wanted to work the personality piece. Right? I wanted their skills. I wanted to have three people where all things were equal. I could just pick the person I liked. And I know that's kind of a crude way to talk about it, but it's my business. It's my office. And the culture and the vibe and the flow of the day-to-day -to, -day, to me is super important. I want to like walking into the office. I want to like who I'm talking to on the other end of the phone. And as the business owner, I get to make that decision. So we're going to put three, four, five people in front of you that are all rock stars. You just got to click and vibe with one of them and, and feel right about it. And then we're going to help you create a perfect onboarding experience so they can go crush the task that we already built with you before we even went through the interview process. That's what I wanted. I want it done for you. I wanted an admin who could just do transaction coordination and may not have to spend three months training them. And that, so that whole training and onboarding and getting someone up to speed, our team helps you facilitate every bit of that. Amazing, man. So how are you guys different then? It, you said like the handoff. Do the contractors, so the team's in the Philippines. I saw you guys have, have a robust team in the Philippines. Do the contractors work for you and then serve the client? Or is it that you're training people up and then handing them off to the client? What is yeah, that? So most people think of employment in two ways. Everybody knows what a W-2 employee is, and everybody knows what an independent contractor is. And those are really the two ways that people have traditionally known how to get help and how to have employment with them. There's a third option, and that's what we are. We're just a service provider. We have a company in the Philippines that services our U.S.-based company that is working with our client partners. So we're here in Dallas. And this is 75 right below me, biggest highway here in Dallas. We're just a US-based company that works directly with our client partners for 10 bucks an hour. So it's just a service agreement. It's not an independent contractor. It's not a W-2. There's no built-in costs or taxes or fees or all the things that is traditionally included with employment, which HR liability is really the company's biggest liabilities when they grow to any kind of scale or size. So we're going to eliminate, I don't even want you to have an independent contractor because then you have to do the 1099 process and you have to worry about legally things being structured correctly so that you're, you're falling in line with IRS. We don't want any of that. We just want you to be able to look at your business formulaically as much as possible, create the best plan, and then just plug and play. So if you want to do more marketing and more leads are coming in, we will time study your business with you to tell you exactly, you know, we know how many people is full-time lead manager. And if you don't have enough calls to hire a full-time lead manager, that lead manager has got a lot of other stuff to do throughout the day. So that's why we get that alignment at the beginning, but we don't want it to be a contractor. We don't want it to be a W2. It's just a service agreement 
It's on the P&L as a service agreement. It's a direct write-off. And then you have no liability whatsoever. Amazing, amazing, amazing. All right, we've gone all over the place. And I'm wondering, because when we started, right before we got on, you're like, ask me anything. Let's get down into the trenches. So is there anything that maybe you wanted to talk about that we haven't touched on yet? Like we didn't really touch on people's biggest fear. Well, kind of, you kind of mentioned, but like, can you hire somebody in another country that is competent? Are they smart? Are they sharp? Are they going to be thinkers and on their feet? Absolutely. In a lot of countries, like for us in the Philippines, we're only hiring college educated people. So you've got nurses and biologists and robotics engineers and people with amazing degrees, just less opportunity. Nursing is insanely competitive. The hospital structures is somewhat, I don't want to use the word predatory because it's going to be a public <laughs> podcast. And they, kill and things, right. But it's, there could be someone, there could be people who would view the way hospitals employ nurses in the Philippines as a predatory type system. And so even though they're really sharp with great degrees, they just don't have the same opportunity as a nurse here in Dallas would have. So are nurses sharp, sharp and capable? Would you hire them to run cops for you all day and, and do some of the other things like let's go and do the admin type task if that's where their skill sets are? Of course, in biology majors and really sharp people, we're hiring the exact same people that you would want within your business. We're doing the same thing, right? I want in my business, competent, college educated, sharp people, great English communication. We all know that English proficiency has nothing to do with IQ or intelligence. But we also know that first impressions and human nature and all the ugly dark side things that we don't really talk about that's not super sexy, we all know that that's there as well, even if we can't talk about it. I like to say, hey, it's there, I get it. I want somebody that represents me well too. I want somebody within my business where when my sphere, when my client base, it doesn't matter if they're calling from Nashville, Tennessee, or New York City, that they're going to have a great experience. So a lot of people, their number one fear is how can I hire someone from another country that could integrate in my business and create the same experience that someone else here could? It's absolutely doable, and we've done it in every market in the U.S. Yeah, yeah, because that is the biggest concern, and I've been through that. We've all been through that. Man, ah. So much more we could get into here. So I'm pretty sure I have this correct, but if I don't, you can smack me down. It's rocketstation.me. Is that right? Rocketstation.me? Uh, yeah, just go rocketstation.com. We're doing some uh, website conversion stuff. So rocketstation.com would be the best place to go there. Ah. And if you're cool with it, I'll get people direct. You know, the reason you and I are talking is because we have mutual connections that have kind of shown our credibility and what we do. So we're really fortunate to be in a position where we don't need or have to have people's business. Several years ago, when I'd go on the road, I'd go to events, I'd panic because of a certain percentage of people didn't sign up. And I was going negative for the week and how I could pay the credit card bill and whatever. You know, that's whenever we started the business, that's what today we're not in that position anymore. And I'm really thankful for that. So the best thing, in my opinion, that I could add, the most value that I could add, is anybody who's really honest about the idea of outsourcing. I don't care if you're looking that higher from us, but if you're serious about this idea of outsourcing or hiring VAs, just spend a little bit of time with us in 30, 40 minutes with our development team. Again, I don't care if you hire our teams or not, but if you're looking for a real conversation and you're not going to waste our development team's time, I would be happy to give you their calendar directly so that anybody who's, who wants to spend some time with them can get a real clear idea of what's possible for their business, how VAs could help them, some outsourcing options and paths, what's the good places to start. Our team can really, in 30, 40 minutes, give you a ton of great insight into your business. If it ends up being a good fit for you, awesome. That would be great. But if not, I really, it's not. It's not, it's just about adding value to people so that they can build the business that they're looking to build. So that calendar, it's Greg's, he's our director of business development. Are, are you okay if he gives Oh yeah, absolutely. It's just discovery.rocketstation.com. So discovery, like a discovery call, discovery.rocketstation.com. That's Greg's live calendar. 
I should have asked them before I told you I was giving that, <laughs> that, that, that team, they're great. They're amazing. They're workforce management experts. So they can look at the number of calls you're getting. They can look at all the different things that you're doing in the day to day. And without any judgment whatsoever, we've seen it all good, bad, ugly. And I promise you, wherever you are, we've seen a whole lot crazier. We've seen some chaos in our day. So that's part of what's fun about what we do is getting to dive in and help people really build a strong foundation. And when it works, when it's a good fit, we get to be a part of that growth and that future success. And where it's not a good fit, then we love to provide the resources that people need to, to be able to build the business that they're looking to build. So go to discovery.rocketstation.com. The team will spend 30, 45 minutes with you. And there's no better place you could start if you're, if you're looking and considering outsourcing. Did you hear that, real estate preneurs? This is your chance to scale with professional, college-educated, English-speaking, lovely people to do all your bidding while you go out there and spend them Benjis. I love it. I love it. Discovery.rocketstation.com. Oh, man, Rob, thank you so much for being here. We appreciate you. And uh, I think we'll be talking again soon. And I'm sure you'll be hearing from some of our real estate preneurs. Thank you so much for having me on. I really appreciate your time. This was a lot of fun. Been following the show because of our connections and uh, seriously, it means a lot that, that you reached out and got me on. I really appreciate the time. This was great. We'll talk again soon, brother. Ciao. This is the podcastfactory.com.